Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the First Parish Church of Stowe and Acton. Our opening words and land acknowledgement will be given off-site by Karen Kinnear. Okay. We would like to acknowledge that this service is being held by a community that gathers on the stolen traditional lands of the Massachusetts, Nipmuc, Pawtucket, and Wampanoag people. We pay respect to those indigenous peoples who lost their lives in the colonization of this land, recognize that these indigenous tribes are still today facing violations of sovereignty, territory, and water. We also give thanks for the earth we walk upon, the waters, the life-giving plants, and all the earth's creatures, as well as the wind, sun, moon, and stars. We recognize this is just a first step in moving toward right relationship with native peoples and healing of the earth. Good morning. And welcome to the First Parish Church of Stowe and Acton, FPC to our members and friends, a welcoming and spiritual community. My name is Karen Kinnear and I serve as the small group ministry coordinator. If this is your first time with us, we welcome you. Our minister and staff are listed on the front of the order of service. Please feel free to ask me or any of these people for more information about the church and its programs after the service or by email or through the chat if you're online. We also invite you to check out our webpage for news and information. You could also sign up there for our newsletter and email alerts. We ask that people remain masked in our sanctuary, except in the balcony, and masked in church offices and RE spaces, but the rest of our building is mask optional. Please check with people you're talking to about their comfort levels and make sure their air filters are on when you congregate in any room. If you would like a large print order of service or hymnal or an assisted listening device, please ask our ushers. Our assisted listening devices are actually small radios that work throughout the building if you would like to listen to the service from another space for any reason. After the service, please join us for coffee and conversation in our fellowship hall, which is one level down at the other end of our building or in a breakout room if you're joining us online. I'd like to draw your attention to the announcements in our order of service, as well as information about how to sign up for our email lists and newsletters. Here are a couple of the key announcements. Please bring your clothing and supplies for City Reach to coffee hour in Fellowship Hall after the service, where the senior youth will be collecting it. If you for forgot to bring your donation, stay tuned to an email from Marissa about an alternate drop-off opportunity. At 2 p.m. today, the Racial Justice Task Force is having a tour of the Jackson Homestead in Newton. RSVP to June McKnight or catch Johanna Pyle or June after church. Friday, this Friday, um, January 20th at uh, 6.30 to 8.30, we're having a special combined Club UU and Parent Social Night. So check your order of service for more details. We hope you can join us. Check out the Religious Education Cottage Meetings and online survey. We want to hear what you're looking for in our RE programs. And the reason I'm doing the announcements is we have extended the small group ministry or SGM registration deadline to next Sunday, which is January 22nd. The deadline is at 1 p.m. We will be forming groups for next year, which starts in February at 2 p.m. Um, SGM is a program in which we form small groups of eight to 10 people who meet for two hours monthly to learn more about ourselves and each other through a facilitated discussion. No preparation is required. I personally have found that anyone I have been in an SGM group with, I have a special connection with, so that when I see them at coffee hour or other church events, I feel delighted to have a chance to catch up. Consider signing up with a friend or with someone you would like to become a closer friend. This week and next, we'll have an SGM table at coffee hour where you can register or ask questions, or you can register online at fbcstowacton.org slash SGM, or feel free to send questions or preferences to me at sgm at fbcstowacton.org or karen at kinyar.com. And now let us come together for a time of community, singing, and worship. Our intro today is one you are familiar with in the congregation, so if you feel so inclined, please sing along with us at your voice. <laughs> Yeah. 
gotta put one foot in front of the other and leave with love. Put one foot in front of the other and leave with love. You gotta put one foot in front of the other and leave with love. Put one foot in front of the other and leave with love. Don't give up hope. Don't give up hope. You're not alone. You're not alone. words this morning are by Lawrence E. McGinty. To this house we come, bringing our boldest dreams, seeking here the inspiration and strength to make them be. To this house we come, hoping to bury broken dreams, to be sustained through their pain, and to discover new ones amidst their tears. We come here lonely, isolated from meaningful human contact, searching for warmth and closeness and care, needing to grow beyond plateaus of the commonplace. We seek here challenges and commitments to, product, to productive of greater wholeness and deeper meanings. We come here intense and constructed, hoping for encouragement to shed our pretenses and be ourselves. Filled with despair and self-doubt, we seek affirmations, prodding us to say yes to ourselves and to life. Somehow, always putting happiness ahead of ourselves, we enter this place trusting that what happens here will enable us to make and to accept a little bit of it now, today. Strange place, this house. Here we cry, sing, laugh, hurt, dance, touch, survive, celebrate, grow, search, doubt, hope, rejoice, pray, trust, care, learn, think, wonder, be, become. Yes, this morning to this house we come. These chalice lighting words are from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Thank you, Jennifer. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. We light our chalice today for light and for love in our community and our world. Please rise now and join in our opening hymn number 298, Wake Now My Senses. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4. Please rise in body, or in spirit.
Please remain standing and join in our covenant and affirmation. Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Now let me introduce our Acting Director of Religious Education, Marissa Evans, who will uh, introduce our story today. Good morning. Good morning. I'm happy to be back and feeling better. I am just going to stay masked out of an abundance of precautions. So today we are going to get to listen to a story read by Sankofa Read Aloud called Let the Children March. Good morning and welcome back to another edition of Sankofa Read Aloud. Today's story is titled, Let the Children March, written by Monica Clark Robinson, illustrated by Frank Morrison. I hope that you enjoy this story. 1963, Birmingham, Alabama. I couldn't play on the same playground as the white kids. I couldn't go to their schools. I couldn't drink from their water fountains. There were so many things I couldn't do. One warm spring night, my family went to church. We weren't there to have regular services. We were there to hear Dr. King speak. We were there to plan. He wanted to raise an army of peaceful protesters to fight for freedom. His brown eyes flashing fire and love. Dr. King told us the time had come to march. If I march, Mama said, I'll lose my job. Sure enough, I can't march, Daddy said. I got a family to feed. The weight of the world rested on our parents' shoulders. But this burden, this time, did not have to be theirs to bear. I don't have a boss to fear, my brother said, or a job to lose. We can march this time. We'll be Dr. King's army, I said. I'll be fine, Daddy, I promise. Don't worry, Mama. Dr. King didn't like children being put in harm's way. He was a daddy too, after all. But he said that though we were young, we were not too young to want our freedom. Let the children march, they will lead the way. On May 2nd, a sunny Thursday, boys and girls, brothers and sisters, cousins and friends, we all met at the church dressed in our best feet ready and a silence so loud that all I could hear was my racing heart, we began to walk. Hand in hand we marched, so frightened, yet certain of what was right for freedom. The path may be long and troubled, but I'm gonna walk on. Would I be hurt? Would we be heard? Would it all be worth it in the end? I wanted to run from the angry faces in the crowd, run from danger, run from fear boys and girls, brothers and sisters, cousins and friends, on and on we marched. We marched, we marched, singing the songs of freedom, 1,000 strong we came. Hate dogged my heels all that day, its yellow canine teeth sharp, but courage walked by my side and kept me going. Disperse or you'll be jailed, the police shouted the first day. Disperse or you'll get wet, the police shouted the second day. Disperse or we'll release the dogs, the police shouted the third day. We did not disperse. We kept on marching. We wouldn't stop until things started to change. Hundreds of us went to jail on the first day and even more on the second. My turn wasn't until the third day, after I was sprayed by water stronger than anything I've ever felt. Rough hands pushed me forward and I fell to my knees in the police wagon. I was going to jail. 
Dr. King reassured our parents, don't worry about your children, he said. They're going to be all right. Don't hold them back if they want to go to jail, for they are doing a job for not only themselves, but for all of America and for all mankind. That night, crowded into a cell too small for even half of the kids, we sang, we shall overcome. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. And freedom is coming. Our parents couldn't be there with us, but still we sang, wrapped in the proud and loving arms of our ancestors. I was still in jail, but we heard that the next day and the next, more kids marched. The water hoses they used to sting us could not stop our fierce tide. The path may be long and troubled, but I'm gonna walk on. Turn the other cheek we had been taught. Show love where there is hate. The world washed as hate bruised us, but for seven days we walked only in love. The jails swelled to bursting and even President Kennedy took notice. Daddy said the president received letters and calls about us from all over the world. Our march would have become a memory, a small part of a larger story, but we had been heard and the seeds of the revolution were sown. Two days and nights I stayed in jail. Some stayed even longer. When I left, I was tired and sore and my best dress was ripped, but my smile was wide as a Mississippi river. I had made a difference. I'm so proud of you, baby girl, mommy said. Your march was what made them see with nothing more than our feet, voices, and courage. We had done what others could not. Change was right around the corner. We felt like a cool breeze in an Alabama August. On May 10th, the great news rang out. Dr. King had reached an agreement with the white leaders of the city. Desegregation would begin. One month later, I was playing on a playground I'd never been allowed to play on before. Two months later, my family ate at a diner we'd never been allowed to eat in before. Our march made the difference. We children led the way. Singing the songs of freedom, 1,000 strong, we came. Thank you. And now I'd like to invite Young up to light our lantern. And all children and junior youth are invited to go to our religious education classes. These words of prayer or meditation are by Audette Fulbright Fulson. They were written several years ago um, after the death of Eric Gardner in memory of him, but they are still sadly appropriate today. Do not think we are finished. Oh no, we will never be finished, never just done, until the light of justice is lit behind every eye. Do not think we will be silent. Oh no, there will not be silence until the world has sung the names of the dead with full throats and still we will sing on. Do not think that fear is the end of us. Oh, you are broken in mind and heart if you even imagine that our fear for our lives is the end of this story. We are braver than you have ever conceived and you will not be the end of us. We have come to take back the world, the world that is the inheritance of better children, better lovers, better days. There will be love again, but justice is our demand now. You will not take us down. We are endless, firelit, determined, and we are coming. Blessed be. 
and amen. Our next hymn is number 95, There is More Love Somewhere. Please rise in body or in spirit and join in singing. Our reading today is a responsive reading, and um, oh, the number isn't in your order of service because I didn't give it to Meg. Let's look it up real quick. There's a nice index at the back of the hymnal that has um, index of first lines. It is in the order of service? Oh, it's the insert. The whole words are in the insert. I thought I saw it there, but then it didn't. I didn't. Okay, great. Then you can just turn to your insert in your order of service. Thank you. I'll look at the number later just for my own peace of mind, but you can if you want to, but it's in there, I promise. I'm going to read the regular if you would read the italics type. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied to a single garment of destiny. There are some things in our social system to which all of us ought to be maladjusted. We must evolve for all human conflict a method which rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. Before it is too late, we must narrow the gaping chasm between our proclamations of peace and our lowly deeds which precipita precipitate and perpetuate war. One we must pursue peaceful ends through peaceful means. The words of Martin Luther King Jr. still resonate with us today. Today we are sharing our gifts as we do every week here at First Parison Church with a different organization that we vote on as a congregation to support. These change monthly. This month um, it's going to the work that our, our social justice task force on supporting asylum seekers is engaged with in the Acton and Stowe area interfaith partnership to support Afghan refugees. 
So for that work that that organization is doing and the work that our committee and our task force is doing with that organization to keep this um, work alive and resonant and vibrant and help and support Afghan refugees uh, and for the work of this congregation, we will now gratefully receive the offering. Thank you, choir. Thank you, Brad. Just in case you did read your newsletter or the website, I wanted to let you know that while it said there that I was going to be preaching on um, a UUA book called Mistakes and Miracles, I've actually altered my sermon entirely. It's still on a Martin Luther King Jr. theme, but I just couldn't quite get as far with that book and its meanings and messages as I'd hoped for for today. So I altered course. I still recommend it. It's still the UUA's common read book, I think, this year, and um, a worthwhile text to engage in as we think about how congregations can work through the, um, the path of becoming more multicultural. But today I'm preaching about conscience and courage. Martin Luther King Jr. said, on some questions, cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it polite? And vanity comes along and asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when we must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but we must do it because conscience tells us it is right. 
Martin Luther King Jr., of course, had this integrity, was driven by conscience, regardless of what was safe or right or popular. He had to, safe or popular or polite, he had to do what was right. If you watch the movie Selma, or if you've read the story of him in Selma, we see a man there who was threatened repeatedly, who was punched in the face in one of the early scenes of that movie in, in the work leading up to Selma. And he was asked not to do the work in Selma by the President of the United States. And he did it anyway. How many of us would refuse a request made by the President of the United States, especially if that request was just to not do something? How many of us would re refuse that request by the President in order to fight for justice? in a fight that might cost our very lives. Maybe not many of us. I don't know that I would, but Martin Luther King couldn't not do it. Living into our conscience for white people, like myself, for many white people in many situations is not a matter of courage. It's not a matter of facing off even against what's polite, what is popular, or what is safe sometimes. So I want to recognize that because for people of color, this is often the case that conscience takes courage, that there is true danger for living your conscience in a way that I have seldom faced. But I do want to step back and examine a few instances where this was true for many white people both historically and then in my own lifetime. Starting with Selma, when Martin Luther King put out the word as he did to white clergy to join him down in Selma, many Unitarian Universalists thronged down and to hear their stories about what it meant to be standing in a line in front of the police there in Selma who were not peaceful who were not there to protect them, but to threaten them and to damage them. It was a scary time. For those who were on the march after, um, which was mostly black people at that time when it was the march that became turnaround or it became Bloody Sunday, um, when they were beaten back off the Selma and Pettus Bridge, that was not safe or polite. And of course, some Unitarian Universalists who went down there to Selma, as many did, the UUA board canceled the, or uh, put a pause in their meeting, tabled their meeting, and all went down to Selma together. But for those who went down first, it was not a safe thing, and some paid with their lives. Unitarian minister um, Jim Reeb died down there, James Reeb, and then, um, drawn down there because of the death of Reverend Reeb was Viola Liuzzo, who also paid with her life. Thinking back over our history, Unitarian Universalism has these martyrs, but it has older martyrs too who paid for their faith. If we think about religious martyrs like Michael Servetus, I often think, why didn't he just stop? Michael Servetus was born in 1509 or 11, somewhere in that range, died in 1553. He was a Spanish theologian. In reading the Bible, he discovered that he didn't find the Trinity in it. Now, Unitarianism and proclaiming it was not so popular or polite or legal, and it cost him to be thrown into jail. But he published his book and he kept pushing it with Calvin, knowing that this might be the case. And one asks, why didn't he just pretend to believe what the church told him to believe? But he couldn't. And he publishes the book, which he titles, Lest You Missed It, On the Errors of the Trinity. The Inquisition persecutes him. He changes his name, becomes a French citizen, and then writes another book, The Restoration of Christianity sends a copy to John Calvin, head of the Reformed Church, thinking that if he just shows him where Christianity has gone wrong, Calvin will see it and all will be well. Calvin sends his own book back. Servetus marks it up, 
showing where Calvin is wrong and continues to communicate with Calvin. Calvin doesn't see it Servetus' way, declares him a heretic. And eventually, Servetus travels to Vienna, where he's arrested, thrown in jail by the Catholics, found guilty, but escapes. They burn him in effigy, but fleeing, and for reasons nobody can understand, he stops in Geneva, the stronghold of the church, where Calvin lives. And since it's Sunday, he goes to church, to Calvin's church, to hear Calvin preach, and is arrested, imprisoned, tried, and burned at the stake. But the last copies of his books bound around him, if you have one, it's valuable. That's courage. Courage in the face of fear, in the face of danger. I think, too, about Norbert Chopek. We'll hear a lot more about Norbert Chopek at the 100th anniversary of the Flower Communion, which he created this spring. Chopek was a Czech minister, and during World War II, he defied the Nazis in his preaching and in his politics, eventually arrested for the crime of listening to foreign radio, the radio that which, which was a gift from his congregation, imprisoned by the Nazis, sent to Dachau, dies there. Some of those Unitarian Universalists who have faced danger who, with their courage are less known to us, perhaps. Do you know of Abner Neeland? Abner Neeland was a Universalist minister who lived from 1774 to 1844. He was born in Gardner, Massachusetts. I used to serve the church in Gardner. Neeland left the Universalist ministry because his views became too radical, much the same way that Ralph Waldo Emerson would later leave the Unitarians. And he then published a Freethinker newsletter. And in 1833, he said in a printed statement, I believe that God and nature, so far as we can attach any rational idea to either, are synonymous terms. Hence, I am not an atheist, but a pantheist. That is, instead of believing that there is no God, I believe that in the abstract, all is God. That it is in God we live, move, and have our being, and that the whole duty of man consists in living as long as he can and promoting as much happiness as he can while he lives. This landed Abner Neeland in the courts. He was the last man to be convicted of blasphemy in Massachusetts. He served 60 days, 60 days, two months in prison for being an atheist, for blasphemy against God. Have you ever had a moment in your life when you have had to have this kind of integrity that, where you knew that you would do what was right even if it wasn't safe or polite or popular? Can you think about someone you've known someone you've known in your lifetime, or maybe someone you've seen in politics or, um, or in civil rights or in the world at large who has had this kind of integrity, who did what was right, even though it wasn't safe or polite or popular. In my lifetime, I've known a few UU ministers who did this. One one is my friend, Valerie. Valerie went to a church that had a history of clergy misconduct, and that church did not want to talk about it. They did not want it named and spoken out loud of, and they wanted to keep in denial about the mis misconduct of their previous clergy. Valerie insisted on naming it. It eventually cost her her job. My friend, Julie, my friend Julie was a student at Star King when a big controversy arose out there. And Julie had said publicly that she had gotten this document that the board considered to be um, secretly leaked. And it's, they assumed it to have been a secret document, although technically it wasn't said that it was a secret document before it was leaked. Julie had said publicly she had received it. And so they asked Julie for a copy and access to all of her emails and said that they would withhold her degree until they got that. Julie refused to hand over her emails, feeling that that was not a reasonable request. It was a violation of her privacy and it caused her to, if she were to hand them over to be in violation of confidentiality that she had been requested to keep by other colleagues. And so she refused. 
and her degree with, was, was withheld for, I don't know, I think it was more than a year before they finally came across the information they wanted in other ways. And somewhat reluctantly, but had nothing really over her and granted her degree. There are those who are right now saying that it takes courage and that some people are too scared to make a statement in Unitarian Universalism that goes against the status quo in Unitarian Universalism. This is an argument made by sort of a fringe group within Unitarian Universalism right now. I don't think it's entirely true. At least for me, it's not risky. I can live up to my conscience. I can disagree with our faith. I can stand up for things that I disagree with without risking anything in a way that takes too much true courage. I may become somewhat pop unpopular. I may get some pushback from the association. Last year, I made an amendment to the uh, rules of procedure at General Assembly. And I got a call from the UUA. Now, some people would say that this is kind of threatening and scary. They called me and said, why are you making an amendment to the rules of procedure? We just want to understand this. And I said, oh, well, here's why I'm making an amendment. And they said, oh, OK. I guess that can go forward. Can we tweak it this way? And I said, OK. And all was worked out. That's the way it's been for my lifetime. I haven't had to have the, f the faith and the courage that my ancestors have had, that Cervantes had, or that Chopek had, or that even some of my colleagues in this couple of decades have had. For many of us, it's not the call to stand up and face true danger, to live into our conscience. Most of us aren't really like Martin Luther King Jr. And that's why we celebrate him so much. He did go further in regards to living up for what was right. But, and here's the but, we are called on to stand true because there may be some issue, some cause, some day for which we do need to take a stand and we cannot turn back no matter what the cost. Martin Luther King said in his I Have a Dream speech, there are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? He said, we can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied as long as our bodies, heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We cannot be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood or robbed of their dignity by signs stating for whites only. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I'm saying that for us, too, right now, there are reasons we must not be satisfied and we must keep fighting and struggling. In 2015, during what was something of the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement, which is still struggling on, when white churches were not always acting yet, the African-American presidents and deans in theological education wrote an open letter to the leaders of all theological schools. And I experienced that something like the call that my um, UU um, mentors received in the civil rights movement when Martin Luther King put out the call for them to go down to Selma. The African-American presidents and deans in theological schools wrote an open letter calling on theological schools to recognize the need for the struggle for black lives, telling them to recognize that this is a Kairos moment, they called it, an opportune and critical moment where we must, quote, arise from the embers of silence and speak up and speak out as the prophet of old, let justice roll down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. And while that was eight years ago, I don't think the moment has changed. 
We are still called to do that. In the book, The Prophetic Imperative, a Unitarian Universalist minister, Richard Gilbert, writes, I think of the Reverend Henry Messerve's provocative question. If you were arrested for being a Unitarian Universalist, would there be enough evidence to convict you? If you were arrested for being a Unitarian Universalist, would there be enough evidence to convict you? We may not be a king or a Servetus or a Chapek, but may there be enough evidence to convict us all. We may not always need to have the courage in the face of true evil. We may not always face the situations that stand for us to stand up against the police or the authorities, to stand up for what is polite, for what is civil, for what is just. Stand up against what is polite, what is civil, what is just. But let us hold Martin Luther King's words from Amos as a beacon in front of us, that we will keep on doing what we can, living into our conscience until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 121. Um, this used to be a favorite hymn of mine. Maybe it's a favorite hymn of yours. I haven't used it in about five years because it um, has come under critique for sometimes having very colonialist language that will build a land. It sounds like, oh, the land was empty here for people to just come and build on. So if you take it in that context, and if we sing it in a too much of a white context, it can take on that resonance. But I think when we hear it with the words about justice rolling down like waters in a mighty stream, and we hear the echoes of Martin Luther King and the echoes of civil rights leaders today saying those words, and we take it in this context of working for racial justice, it takes a whole different meaning for us and is worth singing. So please sing out and sing strong, number 121, rise in body or in spirit.
That was the favorite hymn at my last congregation. I know this because every time I wasn't in the public and there was a lay leader leading the service, they would always pick that hymn. <laughs> Our closing words are by John Alou Johnstone. We shall overcome when we can truly celebrate the diversity of contributions and talents offered by all people. We shall overcome hatred and prejudice and oppression. When we can truly extend our hands to one another in loving acceptance, we shall overcome the past that haunts us now. Living in peace and freedom, we shall overcome the wrongs that have happened and the debts left unpaid. Let us join together in that commitment to overcome. And let us say together, Amen. Our closing song didn't make it into the order of service. My mistake in not realizing it wasn't there. But due to the wonders of technology, our Zoom host, Kim Kinnear, has created a slide to put it up on the screens for you. There you go. So please join in our closing song.